Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Chairman. As I've been introduced, my name is Fiona Gandhi. I'm working at Jakarta to create a cardiac institute uh, in the Department of Electrophysiology. Uh, my task today actually is I'm um, given a case of PVC inducing cardiomyopathy uh, that I'm going to present uh, this time. So this can is. You, can uh, you use the, the big screen? You you have to push the oh, lower button. Oh, yes, 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 yes. Yes, Better. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Is it oh, okay? Please. Yes, yeah. perfect. Go back one. Oh, yeah. so this is a 25 year old. I'm presenting a 25 year old uh, medical student uh, who presented to us uh, the past one year. Actually, came in uh, complaining of palpitation that he had been there for one year. And he described this uh, palpitation as a forceful beat, slow, irregular, and sometimes with the episode of skip beats. Uh, this palpitation were associated with the extreme fatigue. However, he did not report any limitation in his uh, daily activities uh, that were associated with palpitation. Uh, he denied use of cigarette smoking or alcohol use. There was no history of that was suggested for drug abuse. Throughout his life, actually, he denied use of cardiovascular medication, including antihistamine key medication. He had no history that was actually suggested of thyroid dysfunction. Throughout his life, we had no known comorbidities, including hypertension and diabetes, to mention a few. Essentially, his past medical life was uh, reported to be normal. So this is actually the first ECG that we did. And you can appreciate that for every normal sinus beat is followed by uh, PVC. Uh, and this is in a by general pattern, uh, as you can follow this clip. And actually, the axis, it was the inferior, as you can see, lady two, three, and four, they are recording positive diffraction. And this was taking the left bundle branch uh, block pattern uh, to suggest that this PVC was uh, uh, stemming from the right, uh, right out throat tract uh, earlier. So we went on doing the the uh, 24 hour time. You can see it was almost 24 hours of recording. Um, the important findings that we, I mean, important finding that we see here is nearly to 50 percent uh, of the recorded beats were the premature ventricular beats. Um, so it is well known that um, when the patient is having uh, around 10,000 to 25,000 beats per 24 hour, that is regarded as a high burden. When you change it into percentage, it is, I mean, it's said that the high burden count starts from uh, 15 to 24 percent. Now, you can see this one is even two times the upper range of the what is known upper, uh, upper I mean, the high burden PVC of 14 percent. So, you can see this is the baseline echo again, which was done. Important things that we see here, that the L of V uh, chamber looks dilated, and uh, actually there was um, a functional regurgitation in this patient. And also you can appreciate that there is a global hypokinesia uh, in this patient. The ejection fraction you can see here, it was by using uh, the approach of the parastenal long uh, axis, which uh, uh, suggested that the ejection fraction was 54%. But when you go and do things on your approach, actually the um, ejection fraction went as, as uh, I mean down to 32%. Um, the left ventricular internal diameter here, Actually, it is suggesting that by this time, this patient had already uh, developed the left ventricular dilatation, as you can see that the parameters are beyond the uh, measurements that we, we say the, the LOV size is normal. So this way, I actually went on screening the thyroid on this patient. As we know, sometimes the thyroid dysfunction are, are implicated in causing cardiomyopathy, especially when the patient is getting tachycardias. And you can find here, they are recorded normal. So, based on the history of this patient that excluded the other causes of cardiomyopathy, 
except from PVC, we came with the diagnosis that this patient is most likely having cardiomyopathy that we are thinking probably it is uh, related to the PVC, which is uh, actually, uh, we have documented the high, uh, I mean, a high PVC burden. So because of this, we went, uh, we planned that we, we needed to do EP study to possibly do ablation with this patient. So it is very well known from the uh, guidelines that catheter ablation is a class one indication for all patients who, who present with the symptoms or falling ventricular function suspected to be due to frequent PVCs. And, uh, and for, for those patients who actually who are on antidemic medication, but are, uh, these drugs, uh, when they are found to be ineffective, or the patient cannot tolerate. And sometimes when the patient is not preferring to take a, uh, a lifelong medication, then you have to, to consider catheter ablation, which is regarded as class one approach. So this patient now was taken to the cath lab. Here you are having two uh, fluoroscope views. Uh, starting from your left side, uh, we are having these two catheters that actually we 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 uh, we advance them from the right uh, femoral vein uh, through the inferior vena cava and the, through the right atrium and you can through the tricuspid valve to the right ventricle. So basically, this what this view is what is called the right right uh, ob, uh, right anterior oblique view. The importance of this view is that it helps you to, to understand the anatomy of the heart, that anything that is on your right side here is a ventricular, uh, ventricular and whatever is on the, left, uh, on the left side here, that is an atrium. Then in between here, you have a septum, and you can see this translucent area, which uh, actually is marking the uh, what we call the, uh, the EV canal. EV canal. Uh, so that the septum somewhere here now, uh, I'm not sure, uh, basically the tricuspid uh, valve is around here. That's why you can see that the, the abrasion catheter, this abrasion catheter is going from inferior vena cava right at the and through the tricuspid valve to the right ventricle. And all the way it goes up here. And this is what we, we say, this region is right ventricle, ventricular outflow tract. The another catheter that you are seeing here is it's a depolar catheter. This is a CS catheter. It looks to be foreshortened, and I assume this is probably it is within the coronary sinus, and it is beyond the border of right atrium. Probably it has engaged in the coronary sinus. Going to uh, on your right side, this is a left anterior oblique view. Uh, it's essentially, this view helps you to, to differentiate the anatomy of right ventricle and left ventricle. Whatever is, is on this area anterior here, that is right ventricle and the origin. Whatever you see posterior here, that's left ventricle. So, as I said, this catheter is going through the tricuspid uh, annual somewhere there. Now, it goes up to the right ventricle, to the right ventricle flow tract there. Now, looking again on this uh, decapolar catheter, it looks now it is not foreshortened. And normally it, it goes all the way backward here toward the right atrium. As you know, the coronary sinus starts from right side, goes left, and the distal pole actually is correspond to the left atrium. Now, it just uh, outlined the uh, mitral valve uh, ring along there. So I'm assuming mitral valve is somewhere here, as it has been bordered by this uh, catheter, the capola catheter. And tricuspid valve, as I said, is around here. Now, the assumption is here is that mitral valve and tricuspid valve are just like a two eyes that are blinking towards you. And this is very important to understand as far as the anatomy of the electrophysiologist concerned these procedures. So this was very important as a, um, in our catheter we have two types of machine. The first machine is this what is called a conventional machine, the Chinese uh, type. This you can just use the floral using that machine and you can see we are trying to, to, to map using the catheter using that mini abrasion, I mean that conventional uh, machine. But Actually, it was a difficult procedure. We went on using another technology, the well-known CATO-3. Um, just to orient you is that this is the 
uh, anatomical construction made by Cato 3. Uh, you can see the two images. And on this side here, you are having the what we call the template or the bank, where you have the, the, the ECGs that we select as a reference so that we are trying to, we are using this to match whatever we get from this uh, abrasion catheter so that we we say this actually is this one, the PVC or not. And based on this timing, actually we are able to measure the activation time of, of all the signals we get from the intracardiac signal there. And this help us to locate the area of the uh, PVC origin. Down here, you're having the surface CCG and also the mapping catheter for one and also the proximal three and four. And here you're having intracardiac selected uh, coronal, uh, the CS catheter one and two. So going back to these uh, images here, remember, uh, I came. I came from these images. We are in this uh, right. Uh, I mean, the right outflow track area. So this is the reconstruction of right uh, outflow track. Now we are having, we are having this thing here. Uh, actually, this is a scale. What we call local activation time. That anything that comes earlier is labeled as uh, red, and whatever is actually uh, comes late here is uh, is. It comes as magenta. Now, what, the significance of this is that, and this is telling you that this is the earliest area of activation. And normally, when you're having such a, a pattern, it tells you that the arrhythmia is coming from that area. And you can see this the area that uh, there were, I mean, there are these abrasion tags that are are still there, we are abrating this area. And based on the, uh, the area of operation, you can see the, if this this uh, right of outflow track, it is on the anterior and toward the right side, that's the right outflow free wall. And also when you go to this view, the left anterior brick view, you are seeing the, the right ventricle and the posterior, you are seeing the left ventricle. So the extension of the early activation is the anterior and again toward the left free wall surface. That's what was done. But having a on the right, this was not enough because we saw this patient was having a, uh, some PVCs that were not completed during abrasion. So we went on and cannulating the femoral artery. Then later we went to the uh, left side of the heart and mapping was done on the left side and the ablation again was done on that side on the left as we saw again the early activation of that area. So those right and left uh, uh, ablation areas that were done in this patient. So the significance of this uh, uh, approach is that the ECG suggests that it was suggesting to us that the origin of PVC was most likely to be coming from the right side. But when we went in the catheter, but abrading on the right side was not enough. It, may, it was necessary for us to go on the left side. So the conclusion is that whatever you see on the ECG is not exactly the same what you are going to see in tracardiac. Sometimes as a, this is a, one of the examples that we thought it, it was on the right, but abrading on the right was not enough. So after abrasion of, on this patient, you can see this was the immediate ECG that we got. It was now 100% in sinus rhythm. Remember the uh, baseline ECG, there was one normal and one abnormal by Germany pattern, but here throughout this is uh, a normal ECG. Now this, now go to the, on your right side, you are having this ECG strip here. This is done today. The rhythm again is, is sinus rhythm, but there is bradycardia, uh, mind you, this patient is on beta blocker. Uh, so uh, beta blocker probably explain the low heart rate in this patient, the 51 beats per minute, which uh, I'm not worried the patient is doing well. If, I mean, if, uh, physical and activity is, is returned to normal, no palpitation at all, this patient. So this is the echo now, which is was done today morning. As you can see, Remember, if we kept you at the back of our mind, you can agree with me that there is a significant improve, improvement in the ejection fraction. As you can see, there is very good contractility in this patient, and probably the chamber size is not comparable to the one I showed you at the baseline. So, 
this slide is showing you the calculation that we are obtained today. Uh, ejection fraction now is 62 percent, and left ventricular internal diameter now is 5.15, which is normal. Remember, the baseline was 5.7 uh, plus. So this is a good sign on this patient, and we think the progress felt good. So here comes the concept of um, reverse stall cardiomyopathy. It is known that. Normalization of left ventricular systolic uh, function or uh, up to 15% proven ejection fraction occur after PVC have been eliminated. And this particular, particularly have been seen uh, after a five to six months of uh, successful abrasion. However, one, one third of the patient uh, remain uh, with uh, symptoms or they, they, they remain not improved up to 45 months, months, that is three to four years, despite the uh, successful ablation. And the predictors of delayed recovery include late gadolinium enhancement when you are doing uh, cardiac, uh, cardiac magnetic resonance imaging. When you are having longer PVC and QRS, which appear to be very wide, and when there are PVCs coming from the epicardium. This, these three findings will tell you that this patient actually uh, most likely to have a delayed recovery, or in sometimes may have heart failure and cardiomyopathy may keep going on. So the important question here that we need to ask each other is that whether there is a point of no reversibility in the cardiomyopathy in this patient. Several clinical uh, animal models have shown that frequent PVCs in a structural normal heart can result in a cardiomyopathy, which is characterized by reversible LOV dilatation as we have seen in our patient, and systolic dysfunction. Both of these parameters will be noted in our patient. However, it is not uh, clear why some patients appear to be more susceptible, where others are relatively resistant to the development of this cardiomyopathy, despite us having similar high PVC burden. As I said before, the major risk of factor is, is the high PVC burden, the presence of wide QRS complexes, and also uh, when the PVC is guided to, to originate from the epicardium. The other factor that are actually still a debate, uh, it is thought that when the uh, patient is said to be at a high risk when he is having not, uh, is not having the symptoms. But this is not actually, maybe we can get uh, opinion from others, what is their actual opinion. Uh, there's this man actually who is called uh, Walter Etiolo. Actually, he demonstra demonstrated that persistent ventricular by Germany for two, 12 weeks uh, was found to induce reversible left ventricular systolic dysfunction that uh, recovers within four weeks after eliminating the PVCs. Probably this is uh, starting with what we are seeing in, in our patient. Moreover, moreover, actually, he, he was able to demonstrate that the development of left ventricular dyssynchrony uh, increased the QRS uh, width and uh, increased the fibrosis uh, on histological analysis. This were seen in those patients actually who had the chronic exposure to bigenmini pattern, um, which actually he was able to demonstrate that there was a, when this patient had chronic exposure to biogenin, actually, uh, after four weeks of follow-up, they were found to have a still poor LOV function and the LOV dilatation actually did not improve. So uh, it is well known to everyone that fibrosis and the scar burden are considered the subset for ventricular arrhythmia and they are associated, I mean, they are associated with the waste, waste outcome in these patients. So one study actually created 24 participants. Among for, uh, the 24, five were found to have recurrent uh, tachycardia that was associated with rapid, rapid drop in ejection fraction and symptom of clinical heart failure that uh, occurred within six months. Uh, the author actually saying that this suggests that there must be some structural cardiac abnormality that persists after an apparent recovery function. Therefore, the maintenance of and heart failure treatment regime after normalization of ejection fraction and continued monitoring of patient for recurrence of arrhythmia is a prudent uh, strategy that need to be considered in this patient. Yeah, 
This slide here is showing our, what our cathrum here, we have a cut of three. And this is what I was saying, the conventional machine. Uh, you can see our professor, our mentor, our professor Mevati seated here instructing us what to see and what to do. And here is uh, Mr. Hossam from the Johnson & Johnson um, company. This is very nice one. Everyone is welcome to come, welcome to come and work in this cathedral. This slide I shared to you to show what has been, uh, what uh, transpired at JKCI this year. Actually, what is important here, you find that there is increased number of cases that, that has been done uh, since the start of this year. We started with five cases, and here we had eight cases, and here we have 12 cases. Another finding is that there, there is an increase of PVC cases that have been done uh, this year, starting from two, three, and four cases. Also, we have an increased number of atrial fibrillation that have been done, and all these patients are doing very well. So, uh, this message is, give, message, message is giving us that if we combine our effort in Africa, we are able to have a community, a society, that is actually can enjoy the life in, in, out of arrhythmias. Out of our we are able to participate in the sport. So this is the area that we needed to, to, to make a bigger effort to make sure that uh, we strengthen uh, almost every part of the Africa. And we appreciate Professor Mevat for all the effort that she has been doing to, to enable us to be, uh, keep growing every time. Uh, we know next we have been informed that next year we're going to, to host the afra afra meeting but uh, i talked to bon and he promised to send us uh, the official the, the the letter introducing what can be done so it has not been done i hope he's hearing me maybe after this session he will be talking uh, to to let us know what's the plan ahead now you are warmly welcome and what you are seeing is very nice environment these are very beautiful animals you have mount Kilimanjaro, and i think everyone around the world would be delighted to come more and, and, and participate this uh, expected uh, after meeting that is we we actually are looking forward to to to, to be hosting tanzania thank you this is my last slide